All right, guys, welcome back for the last section here of chapter 13. Today we're going to be talking about the challenge of poverty. So we'll look at government standards and how the government defines poverty. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the causes of poverty and look at distribution of income in the United States. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the government policies um, that have been enacted with the intention of combating poverty. So some different terms here for this section, we'll talk about the poverty threshold, which is the income level below which income is insufficient to support a family or a household. The poverty rate then is the percentage of people who live in households below the official poverty threshold. Talk about income distribution, which is the way in which a nation's total income is distributed amongst its population. And then a food stamp program, many of you have probably heard of, but is a government program that helps low income families buy food. We'll look at the Lorenz curve, which is just a curve that illustrates income distribution in the United States. We'll talk about enterprise zones, which are areas where businesses can locate free of certain state, local, and federal taxes and restrictions. Um, often enterprise zones are put into place to help combat poverty um, and help low-income neighborhoods. Also talk about block grants, which are federal funds that are given to states. And then workfare, which is a program that requires work in exchange for temporary government assistance. So what are some of the different factors that have an effect on the poverty rate? Here, um, we're just talking about like statistically speaking, what are some of the demographics or characteristics of a population that make them more predisposed to face poverty in their lifetime? Um, and so it can be about the type of family, like how big is the family? or how small, um, what's their age, what is their residence like, like where do they live, um, where they live can have a huge impact, um, level of education can have an impact on poverty, um, the growth of low skill service jobs can have an effect on the poverty rate as well. Um, Families or individuals can be more predisposed to facing poverty um, based on their race or ethnicity as well. So according to the government, a poor family is one whose total income is less than the amount required to satisfy the family's basic minimum needs. What do you need? How much money do you need to keep a roof over your head and keep your family fed? is essentially what they're looking at. So the Census Bureau determines the poverty threshold required to meet those needs. And the poverty threshold is often going to vary based on the size of the family, right? Because if you have more people, you have more people to feed, that's going to cost more money. So if a family's total income is below the poverty threshold, everyone in that family is considered impoverished or poor. Um, some examples of poverty thresholds, um, most recently I have the 2016 um, poverty thresholds here. It was just under um, $13,000 for a single individual under the age of 65, um, $14,500 for a household of two people um, where people are 65 or younger and have no children. It was um, just over $24,000 for a family of four with two children under the age of 18. And those numbers have increased, I know, a little bit in the past four years, but not by a ton. So the poverty rate then is the percentage of households that are living below those poverty thresholds. Um, and so we see in this graph, we're floating right around like 10 to 14% um, of households are living 
below that poverty threshold. Um, the last year in this graph is 2006. Um, at that point, we're at 12% of the population, um, which is equal to roughly like 37 million Americans. So that's a lot of families, right? Now, poverty rates differ sharply by group, according to several different indicators. Um, oftentimes, in regards to race, we do see a poverty rate um, is higher amongst minorities rather than um, white families. In regards to the type of family, um, oftentimes single mother families have a high rate of poverty compared to the rest of the general population. With age, um, children are the largest age group living in poverty. And then residents, um, we actually have double the poverty rate in cities versus in the suburbs. And a lot of that has to do with the type of housing that is available um, in those locations. All right, so here we can see again just kind of how the poverty rate has differed amongst different um, groups of people based on their race, age, household type, so on and so forth. Um, so here, kind of just to summarize, um, households that are headed by women, African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, um, were more likely than other groups to have incomes below the poverty threshold. The group on this chart that has the highest poverty rate um, is female-headed households at nearly 30%. So the failure to earn adequate income is often the result of unemployment. However, more than half of impoverished households have someone who works at least part-time, um, lots of times multiple part-time jobs. Um, one in five impoverished households has a full-time year-round worker. Um, and for those working poor, um, usually the problem is low wages, right? Working minimum wage jobs. Um, shifts in family structure, um, oftentimes from a two-parent family to a single-parent family, can really be economically challenging um, and can lead to an increase in the amount of families living in poverty. Um, so this can be a result of a divorce or of a parent um, passing away, right? And those sorts of things can be super, super challenging um, economically for a family to take on and adjust to. Um, oftentimes, when we're looking at sort of wage gaps, um, so the difference between um, the amount of money that people make, um, even if they're working in similar or the same jobs. Um, there's a couple different wage gaps. Um, so we have wage gaps between people who live in the inner city um, versus people that live outside um, in the suburbs. We see a wage gap there. Um, we also see that white workers generally earn higher salaries than minority workers. Um, and men generally earn more than women. Um, so the inequality um, that can result from wage gaps um, can also result then in those differences in um, poverty rates amongst those various groups. Um, inequality often results from differences in hours worked, education, um, prior work experience, and sometimes, unfortunately, just discrimination, whether that be in hiring practices or, like, once a person is actually employed as well. So some causes of poverty. Um, the growth of globalization has led to a decrease in high-paying manufacturing jobs, blue-collar work, um, because a lot of that blue-collar work has been shipped overseas. 
And so this forces um, a lot of people that lack the education for a um, professional position to work in low skill service jobs where wages tend to be low, right? Lots of times those low skill service jobs are going to be minimum wage jobs and minimum wage jobs just don't make the cut um, for many families, right? Um, so lack of education can lead to poverty as well. Um, so kind of just to summarize, some different causes of poverty would be unemployment, um, changes in family structure we talked about, racial and gender discrimination, growth of low skill service jobs and globalization, um, lack of education. So to fully understand poverty in the United States, you also need to understand income distribution. So the table on the left here shows family income ranked by category. Um, so when plotted on a Lorenz curve, which is to the right, this data shows the distribution of income in the United States. Um, so if we're looking at like the highest fifth, so the highest 20% of income earners in the United States, that highest 20% actually holds over 50% of the income, right? The lowest 20% holds three and a half, not even three and a half percent of the income that's distributed throughout the entire economy, right? If we truly had equality of income in this percent of income quintile, we would see 20% across the board, right? But instead we see the lowest 20% of income earners are earning only 3.4% of all of the income available in the economy. And so we're going to see a lot of those people underneath the poverty threshold. So as you can see from the chart in the graph, the wealth, wealthiest fifth of American households earned more income than the bottom four fifths combined. And so factors that lead to this income um, gap can include like differences in skill and education level, inheritances, right? So if your parents had money and money is passed down through the family, um, you're gonna stay in that highest um, 20%, the field of work um, that people are in. And in the last two decades, the distribution of income in the United States um, has become less equal than it even has been in the past. So the government spends billions of dollars um, on programs designed to reduce the poverty rate. Um, critics of these types of programs often argue um, that they hurt the very people that they are intended to help. Um, you know, saying that if we give government assistance, then people don't have to get jobs and then we get in this like cyclical issue of poverty. Um, so some of those criticisms have led to new policies, um, but some examples of these government policies would be like the earned income tax credit. So this is a refundable tax credit that low income families with children can receive when they fill out their federal income tax return. And it often offsets the impact of the Social Security payroll tax on low income families. So we all pay the Social Security payroll tax in our weekly or biweekly, no, bi monthly paychecks. Um, and so the earned income tax credit helps kind of offset um, that financial tax burden for low income families. Um, in 2005, the Earned Income Tax Credit lifted more than 4 million people above the poverty line. We also have enterprise zones, um, which are put in place to benefit businesses by lowering their costs and helping local people um, by making it easier for them to find work. So the goal is 
we're going to place businesses in these lower income communities, give people an opportunity to find a job within their community, and hopefully that job can push them out of poverty, right? In recent decades, um, federal and state governments have designed job training programs to help workers who lack the skills um, they need to earn an adequate income. The government also has established a minimum wage as well. Um, the minimum wage is still $7.25 an hour. Um, so if you are working a minimum wage job um, and are part of a family of um, four, you are not going to make enough even working full time to get above the poverty threshold. Um, so some people have to work multiple jobs. Um, and in recent years, there's been a political debate about um, raising the minimum wage to what some call a living wage, um, which would basically guarantee if you had a full-time job um, at minimum wage, you would make enough to be above the poverty threshold. The government also has programs to help poor people obtain affordable housing as well. Um, another example um, of a government program would be a welfare program um, called the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, passed in uh, 1996, and it provides block grants to states, um, and states can then use those that money um, towards programs that help move basically um, impoverished adults from welfare to dependence um, to ultimately the goal being full employment um, where they would get out of um, poverty. It was hoped that this reform would reduce poverty by providing poor Americans with labor skills and access to a steady and adequate income. So there's also um, those sorts of programs that federal government funds in partnership with the states and the states help um, institute some programs as well to help get people out of poverty. All right, that's our last section of chapter 13. Have a good rest of your day.